So, without any further ado, let me int instantly introduce you to Justin. <laughs> Thank you. So we've reached a real point of inflection in terms of consumer behavior in the last uh, five years. You've seen a lot of charts like this, so I'll just show you another one just so you're most up to date on the latest numbers. But at the end of this year, 81% of US consumers will have a smartphone in their pocket as they're walking around. Um, it's almost as high in, in the UK and, and we're seeing penetration like that in other countries. For certain consumer segments, smartphone penetration has exceeded what we have seen for a lot of years in terms of laptops and PC access. So this is really interesting. We now have the opportunity to talk to consumers in a significant way as they are out and about. We don't have to just talk to them while they're at home on their sofa. We can talk to them anywhere we want to and do so, in fact, in real time. So a couple of key elements of crowdsourcing something through mobile. So one is, do we have access to the crowd at scale when we need it? Like, are the respondents going to be out there when we want to talk to them? And then secondly, are they ready, willing, and able to participate in the, the exercise that we're giving them? Finally, is the problem we're trying to solve one that the crowd is uniquely qualified to assist with at scale? And that's important. So let's talk a little bit about why crowdsourcing through mobile is actually vital. Uh, the reason is that context matters. There are certain questions that only a person standing in context can actually answer for you. Uh, and crowdsourcing through a large audience of, of mobile consumers, this is really the only way you can get at all these elements. Now, I am not a research psychologist by trade. I'm a technologist. I build mobile platforms, and I engage consumers through mobile. But the research psychologists here at the conference will talk about these particular elements. So when I want to talk to a consumer and get realistic responses from that consumer, context is going to significantly change how that consumer decides to respond. If they are standing where they might actually make a decision about something, their response will be very different than if we're asking them before they went or after they were there. Context is a significant driver in terms of how the consumer will behave as we're asking them questions. And mobile gives us direct access to consumers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, 85% of consumers in the US um, uh, by this time next year will be reachable to us in real time when we feel like it. And we've seen significantly consumers are very willing to respond. So context provides that. It's that you know, better than hindsight. It's better insight to that consumer. And then, really importantly, it's better foresight. Asking the consumer what their behavior might be when they're standing there where they might actually make the decision is going to be far superior than asking the consumer how they might respond to something uh, a week before they go do it. When they're actually there, that's when they decide. Uh, and so uh, in-context provides it best, and mobile is what provides us the access to in-context consumers at a significant scale. So thinking about crowdsourcing through mobile, we have to find a business problem. So let's, let's explore that idea for a second. Um, in the CPG industry in the United States, 25,000 new CPG, CPG products hit grocery store shelves every year. Now, I don't know if that's that companies like General Mills and Procter & Gamble are bored and feel like they just need to reinvent themselves all the time, but that's a lot of new product to be showing up at grocery stores in front of consumers all of the time. You're talking about literally hundreds of new products every day are showing up on a shelf somewhere. It could be a small regional test, it could be a large national campaign uh, or rollout, but this is a significant problem for CPG companies. Every year, 25,000 of their competitors' products hit store shelves. So how do they learn about that and learn about it in real time at scale to understand what's out there, how do consumers feel about it once they see it, uh, as well as where is it sitting? Like where is it actually sitting in the store that that consumer gave me that response? So what we've built around that is a solution we call Product Watch. Um, and this is not a sales pitch, this is just to give you an idea of the type of scale we've been able to achieve. So what we do is we leverage shoppers as they are arriving at grocery stores and we invite them to go on a scavenger hunt in the store. These are audience members that we have pre-recruited. They've said, yes, I'm willing to go do fun, adventurous things in stores. And one of the activities they get prompted to do when they arrive at the store through their mobile device is go on a scavenger hunt for us and find these new products on the shelf. It is incentivized. Um, we are alerting companies as soon as this data comes in. So this literally is occurring in real time. 
On a daily basis, I get 10,000 product evaluations from my consumers in actual grocery stores. And clients get alerted every time a product in a category they care about or from a competitive brand is found and discovered so they can come access the data in real time. So we have done uh, geofenced grocery stores, convenience stores, mass merchandiser stores. Consumers are invited, again, on that mobile device when they arrive. That means they are natural shoppers. They were going shopping anyway. They didn't know about this until the minute they walked in the store. As soon as they walk in, they receive that alert. It's, a, it's gamifying the real world. This is a fun, adventurous activity for them to do while they're shopping, and they can earn some fun prizes. Um, once they find the product, they have to take two photos of that product for us, a close-up shot, what we call the hero shot, and a, a shot from a few feet away so we can see the entire context of the shelf. And then they give us an evaluation about how they feel about that product as they see it on the shelf. So we're crowdsourcing for two things here. One is just what's out there. What is on the shelf and, and uh, where is it sitting? And that's through the photos that we're getting uh, from these consumers. And then secondly, we're crowdsourcing the insights of how shoppers who were there at the store anyway actually feel about it. And again, we're on pace for about 3.5 million product evaluations over the next year. So just a quick example of what this looks like when we get these photos back. Um, and again, this is occurring in grocery stores, drug stores, and convenience stores. We code it for all of the elements we see in the photo. Everything we can see on the label, plus what it's sitting next to. The mobile app that the consumer has on their phone tells us about that consumer. Where are they at? What store are they in? How long have they been there? Uh, as well as uh, the date and time, of course. And then, additionally, the consumers tell us how they feel about the product. And this is done just through a short survey that they're doing, again, right at their, as they're standing there at the shelf and can give us their true feelings about that product that they're probably seeing for the first time. So a quick example of the way we're leveraging this data, um, someone can come to our platform, access to this data is free. Uh, you can come in, perform a search, we tell you all the products that we have that match that, and then something like competitive products. Products that consumers see as competitive to this brand. And then this is how we display that data back. So again, we've crowdsourced where this product is, we provide a very simple map, we provide metrics in terms of how the consumer response was to that individual product. 30 or 40 days after this product very first hits the market face, uh, marketplace, we can have thousands of consumer responses from consumers who found, discovered this product on the shelf, took the photos to tell us where the product was, and then evaluated that product. And all of this data is available to our uh, clients in real time. And in fact, it's available to anybody through, uh, through our free search capability. We also tie the data to another form of crowdsourcing. And the other form of crowdsourcing is social. So once we've discovered that a product is out there, we mine social media platforms, not uh, inherent to one, but all of them that are publicly available through APIs. And we'll pull in the real-time commentary and feedback about those, those products. This isn't from our shoppers. This is from other consumers who may have just heard about it online, um, seen a commercial about it, have, are trying it in their own home and trying it for the first time. So it provides another form of crowdsourcing on top of what the shopper said. This is what the voice of the, the consumer group in general is saying. And again, all of this data is available in real time. It's one of the great things about the fact that mobile is out there. Consumers not only have it in their pocket, but they've adopted it. And they've adopted it to the point that we find consumers are so willing to do the scavenger hunt mission once they discover it as they're walking into the store that we have to stop them. We have to cap it and say, hey, you've run through your maximum number that you can do today. The average consumer, uh, we found out, was willing to do 72 scavenger hunt product evaluations during a store visit if we just let them go. That was the number that they just went and did because they thought it was fun to go try to find new products. Mood lighting. <laughs> So what are some other use cases for this? We have done this uh, in the CPG space. We've done it for grocery. We have a lot of clients that we work with in that space. Um, and I think we've demonstrated aptly at the point of 10,000 consumer product evaluations on a daily basis. Consumers are willing to do this. They are not hesitant at all. Uh, about 28% of the, our consumers who receive the invite to do this at the store say yes. And that 28% includes consumers who are receiving the invite on their phone for the first time. So this is not a trained audience that's just you know, specialty at, at doing this. Um, we're talking about thousands and thousands of consumers who are adopting this on a monthly basis now and just find it fun to do uh, in the store. But there's a lot of other categories this can apply to. 
Um, any other retail shopping, certainly food and restaurant specialty is a great, uh, great source for this. And consumers love, absolutely love, to share their opinion about what's going on when they're at a restaurant. Uh, we have found you just can't shut them up about it. Um, live sports and concerts, movie and entertainment, and then um, automotive purchase and repair is another one that we think really fits this because consumers show up there and then have to wait. And that waiting time is just a great opportunity to get to talk to them about what their experience is like as they're there. And when you're talking about things like um, the automotive purchase process or getting your vehicle repaired or serviced, you're talking about tens of thousands of consumers on a daily basis who are all going through the same thing. And yet if we wait to ask them about their experience with that, you know, whatever happened until a week later, or when they get that follow-up survey, you know, through email 10 days later, they just may not remember how they're actually feeling or what their experience was like or if someone was rude to them uh, if they waited too long. Those things may have drifted away, but you can actually talk to them while they're there and they're perfectly willing to say yes in a very significant way. I let you go early. Thank you, Justin. If I'd known you were going to catch up our, our lost time, then uh, questions from the audience or comments? Yes, we have one in the middle here, please. So I understand that you have the consumer on the scavenger hunt, take a picture, prove that they found it, all that good stuff, and then answer a survey. Do you ever um, survey people post-use? Because that tells you they're interested in trying it, their you know, initial impression. But do you ever get any data post-use? We do. Actually, one of the questions we ask as they're evaluating the product at the shelf is, how likely are you to purchase this product? It's a five-point scale, very traditional research approach. There's actually a sixth point on that scale. And that sixth point is, I'm actually going to purchase this product today. That happens about 4% of the time. So I'm getting you know, 10,000 product evaluations on a daily basis. That means 400 times a day, the consumer not only found the product, but they think it's interesting enough, they're buying it. I'm not paying them to. They're just putting it in the cart. We automatically follow up with those consumers six hours later to say, hey, you, earlier today you said you bought the new high protein Cheerios. Have you had a chance to try it yet? Uh, if you haven't, are you willing to try it for us now? Or when you do try it, come back and we, we'd love to know what you think of the product. So we do that in an automated fashion. Again, um, we, really interesting. We find about 80% of the people who said I'm buying this product today say yes to being willing to follow up after to tell us what they thought of the product. And again, that is not incentivized purchase in any way, shape, or form. The consumer found it interesting enough to decide to make that purchase on their own. Interesting. Anybody else? I have one question for you, Justin. Um, Everybody is asking for faster and faster data. What worries me is we're getting the information, but where do we get the time to develop insights and understanding from the information? Any ideas on that? It's a great question. Um, it is one of the challenges I've run into with clients that have access to this data set. Um, on a given day, they might receive two or three alerts that a competitor has launched some product in a space that they're in. And it'll come back and it says, oh, wow, 86 consumers have already evaluated this product just in the last 24 hours. And lo and behold, it's got a purchase intent of you know, 90%. Wow, that's really high. We should do something. More often than not, my real-time data, what it inspires is more research. That's really what this inspires. A crowd of initial respondents who saw it in the store told us this. Let's deep dive. Uh, and we re really rely on our, our market research partners to do that deep dive part. I'm not a full service market research agency. Um, that's not what our company does. We're about real time insights, you know, crowdsourcing things through mobile and online. Uh, and this is an example of mobile. So we love that it leads to that. But I think your underlying question is there's so much data coming at us so fast, and especially when it's data like this that's in real time, how do you make sense of it all? Um, and it's a, it's a great point. We rely on these beautiful, beautifully you know, built dashboards that are very easy to use and navigate for this particular you know, crowdsource uh, result. And we find that it works quite well. Um, but uh, when you add in things like what ads were these consumers exposed to in the 24 hours leading up to the time that they went to the grocery store, data I also know, it starts to get extremely complex. And that's where the prior discussion we just had about the need for that really strong big data analysis. Sourcing real-time data is increasingly easy. That's not a significant challenge for the industry anymore. We have access to the data. Now it's a matter of curating that data um, uh, as we just talked about, and then figuring out what, you know, making sense of that data so that the real-time data turns into uh, insights that are actually actionable within, you know, a reasonable period of time. 
Any last questions? Oh, we have one more here. Thanks. Hi. I might have missed something in the task that you asked the shoppers to go through. Is it, uh, let me just ask this quickly and then I have a follow-up. Sure. Are you asking them to report on something that they're finding for the first time, or are you directing them to look for a product that you know of? It's a mix of both. If I have products that I know I need more data on, then it's a, what we call a directed hunt. I show them the product to go find. I may not even know where it is in the store, but I show them an image of the product that another consumer found. It's, a, it's someone else's photo. And I say, this is the product you're looking for today. Uh, it's a soup. It might be in the soup section. It could be in the baby food section. You're going to have to go find it. That's a scavenger hunt for that consumer. If I don't have a specific product to find, then I tell them to find a product that's new to them. It's new to you, first time you've seen it. So here's, so here's my question. Um, there are 45,000 SKUs in a typical grocery store. A typical shopper buys 400 SKUs over the course of a year. So probably 20,000 SKUs are new to them, even though they're not really new to the market because they must have an intentional blindness. They're all like the gorilla, you know, in the of video course. kind of thing. So uh, the first time you ask people to do, to go through the scavenger hunt in an undirected, non-directed way, do you find that there's a very high percent of things they're reporting on that actually do already exist? And if so, what does that tell you about you know, people's mental processes and, and brand awareness. What we really find is the default to, if I don't tell them the product to look for, the default is they find a product that says new on the label. That's the default. They aren't necessarily finding, you know, um, uh, uh, Diet Coke or, you know, Crystal Pepsi that now is being re-released and saying, oh, that's new to me, I've never bought it. It isn't products that have existed for a long time. Their default, because I've told them what I'm looking for are products that are new to you, about 85% of the time, it says new on the label, which CPG companies, of course, can do for the first six months that products are in market. So what we, the way we talk about this, though, with our clients is the products that are being evaluated are new to the, that consumer. That's who they're new to when they're doing that type of hunt. Uh, and we're trusting that the consumer is telling us the truth, that that product is new to them. But as you just said, there is that, in, that blindness. Until we've told them, hey, be on the lookout for these new products. Uh, but again, most of the time it says new on the shelf, especially at Whole Foods and, and Trader Joe's where they don't put new on their product labels that often, but they have new on the shelf. And then for you know, more general CPG, it often says new on the package for the first few months the products are in market. Okay, well thank you Justin yep. for thank you. ending on time.